All right, uh, the next presenter is actually myself uh, and Sarah Battersby. Uh, I was asked to moderate this session, so uh, I agreed to. <clears throat> Before uh, we get started, uh, Sarah and I are going to talk to you a little bit about thoughts on working with map projections. And before we get too far, we want to make a, a very clear statement that there are, there's no single best projection uh, to support all possible map reading tasks or map purposes. Um, there are righter or wronger choices, uh, but there is no, there's no single best choice. Why should you care? I think most of us would agree that at some point uh, projections do, do become truth and what they present to people, the impressions they make about land masses and so forth, symbol size. Um, even when people understand the projections are distorted, unless they're people like Dan Streeby or Bohan, uh, they often can't mentally adjust. We have a, a pretty good example here of a flight uh, airplane shows up on one side of the projection. People linearly associate that we just draw a straight line and that's where it ends up, but in fact it, it isn't necessarily depending upon the projection. So there's some cognitive issues there as well. Also, there's not a lot of great resources that are available on the web or otherwise to uh, help you select projections specifically uh, and to understand this is kind of an interesting geo-awesomeness. Uh, top seven maps that ultimately explain map projections, and this was number two. These Gediman profiles uh, are uh, amazing map projection explanations from 1921. Uh, so map projections are hard, or at least difficult. Uh, so Sarah and I wrote a book. Uh, both Sarah and I have taught projections, we've researched projections, we've thought about projections, we've done a lot of thinking about projections and from the teaching aspect, uh, how do you get students to decide through all the parameters, all the nuances, which projection to choose? Well, there are some general selection guidelines that exist. Uh, this one happens from mailing. So if you look on the, the left-hand side, if, you, if you're familiar with the projection properties, sort of weed your way through to the map use task or work in reverse. If you're familiar with the map use task, then you weed your way back to the property. But it's not very specific. It doesn't really help you choose a single projection, much less make the decision uh, which parameters and so forth to choose. Uh, another projection selection guideline widely cited by John Snyder uh, talks uh, a little bit about geographic scale and the importance of that in the selection process. Uh, he does provide a bit more guidance in terms of a hierarchical structure. Uh, know your distortion patterns. Obviously, different distortions have different patterns uh, to them, and the distortion impacts not only the, uh, the shapes, configuration of the landmass, but it can also alter the symbolization methods uh, that uh, are used in the map. Most importantly, we, we, we think that the map reader, the map purpose, and what the map reader needs to interpret is, is a big factor. We see on the left uh, a pseudo cylindrical projection showing the range of a uh, missile, uh, shown rather inappropriately. Uh, on the right, we have a flow map that is being displayed on uh, interrupted projection. Uh, so we would like not for those choices to be made. Uh, <laughs> At, at a minimum. So uh, at this point, I'll turn things over to Sarah and she'll uh, give some more description. Or I'll help give you some justification on how to, to choose some incorrect map projections because then we'll have more things to talk about next year. Uh, because Fritz and I do like to find these examples and then skewer them openly. And um, yeah, maybe there'll be a good practical cartography day talk on the horrible things that people have done. It'll be our year of review. <laughs> oh. So before I get started with my, my half of this talk, I did notice that Dan Streeby is in the audience. And while I'm fortunate to get to hassle him every day with my dumb questions since we, we work together now, um, I did just want to, to point something out specifically to him that I'm going to be using some technical terms in this portion of the presentation that you may not understand, um, like squished or perhaps stretchy. And so, so just, just so you are aware that these may be, be beyond your, your capacity for projections. 
good. Good. Um, so when Fritz and I were, were thinking about putting together this book, we really wanted to come up with a way that would be approachable for people to understand the challenges of map projections and have the resources that they needed to understand not just what is appropriate for the map type that they're working with, because even within any given map type, there isn't a single, if you're making a choropleth map, use this projection. There is not one single choice that you have. Um, so, so getting people to think about the fact that it's broken up, you know, not just by map type, but you have to think really carefully about what the specific tasks are that users might be trying to do with your, with your map. Um, so so we, we broke things down to get people thinking about what is your data? Um, how is your data distributed? How does it occur in space? What is the map type that is appropriate for that? Um, so the symbolization method, thinking about the intended map purpose. So what is somebody going to try and do with this? And then um, who are the people actually reading this and what knowledge are they bringing into the map reading process? So how can you, you help um, avoid confusing them more than, than necessary? So the way we broke it down, um, you know, largely by map type to start with. So for instance, thinking about continuous and abrupt phenomena, um, so those normally get mapped into a choropleth map, and trying to get, get it, to make it really clear what the types of tasks are that somebody might accomplish, whether it's looking for values at a single location, whether it's comparisons across multiple locations, where you might be concerned about how far away things are, so how much is distance distorted on this map projection, or how much area is covered by any particular class, in which case you want to think about how is area distorted on your map projection, or something like broad regional patterns where people might be using uh, visual aggregation, um, how many polygons are adjacent, what, cast, what classes are they, how big of an area do they cover, what shape is the clustered region of polygons, and I use the word shape um, loosely here. Dan and I can, can dialogue about how shape is distorted on projections. Um, is that shape perhaps stretchy? or skewed in some way, um, and, and helping people understand that there are specific projections that are going to serve individual tasks better than others. Um, also, we spend a lot of time talking about these problems of what happens at the periphery. Fritz showed a really nice example of flow lines going across um, the edges on an interrupted map projection, and that's one of the things that's kind of near and dear to my heart, the fact that it turns out that the, the Earth being kind of spherical-ish, there isn't really an edge. Uh, but on maps, it turns out that we have lots of edges, and it makes it really hard for people to wrap their heads around how far apart things really are because of where you choose the center of your projection, for instance, or where you draw these interruptions. And that just makes people's brains hurt. So we should be thinking very carefully about the periphery at all times. Um, with choropleth maps specifically because a lot of the tasks do end up being area and, and distance uh, focused. Thinking with uh, medium to large geographic extent, some of the challenges of how large geographic areas appear compared to others. For instance, how large um, is our blue continent versus our red country? Yeah, we have we have some geographic differences between an equal area and a non-equal area projection. Or in the tiny, tiny little orange countries highlighted, um, we've got Morocco and Sweden. What if we're looking at something that involves us comparing the area of those? Maybe I have a density measure, and I know the density of widgets that are produced in each of those countries, and someone, for some horrible reason, decides to try and backwards transform to figure out how many widgets there might be in each location. And if the areas cannot be comparable, or if the areas are not comparable, it turns out that you totally misunderstand what the spatial distribution is. Now, on the other hand, um, with small geographic extents, you have a lot more choices because it turns out with, I think, pretty much any map projection, so long as you choose parameters that don't really suck, you can effectively minimize the distortion to the point where just pick something that looks good. Uh, so here we've got two examples where all we're doing is adjusting the parameters for the projections and we can make a non-equal area map projection work pretty well. We can make a conformal map projection work pretty well. And here we're showing distortion of either angular relationships or of um, aerial relationships. And because, the sh let's just use another technical term, because the shading is not particularly dark, the distortion is not particularly great in either of our uh, more local scale mapping examples. 
Another map type that, that I think is interesting to highlight that we covered in the textbook or in the book is looking at isorhythmic mapping. And one of the fun challenges with isorhythmic mapping is that you don't just have to be concerned about what projection you use when you are displaying the information to a map reader, but you need to be really concerned about what map projection was used when you were creating the data that is going to go on the map because all of the measurements, or all of the, the calculations for the isorhythms are gonna be based on distance measurements. And if you are screwing up your distance measurements because you have selected an incorrect map projection, then you are going to be screwing up the values that you are then going to put on the map that you will hopefully not screw up the map projection for and further confuse people. Uh, so we, we provide a lot of examples of the calculations of these and showing people what are the impacts on the actual interpolated values based on the projection choice that you make, and then what are the results on the projected map that you would then be displaying to show the results. And you can look at some of the, some of the differences between how shapes are represented, how different um, features get cut based on interruptions on the projections, look at the area that's covered by any of these particular, um, particular isorhythms. So some of the big takeaways from this, uh, you know, from, from writing the book, we really want to emphasize that, first of all, people need to know their data, know how the data was created, um, know the symbolization method and the strengths and limitations and make sure they're at least symbolizing the data correctly. Um, understand how the audience is going to be using the map because hopefully you're making the map with a specific purpose in mind. And if you can understand the tasks that someone was trying to, is going to be trying to accomplish, you can pick the projection that is going to be the best for helping them fulfill that specific task. If it's an area-based task, thinking about how to minimize aerial distortion. If it's an, uh, a task where people are taking a lot of angular measurements, how do you minimize the angular measurements? Uh, thinking about how to do measurements on an ellipsoid and then visualize the results on a projection. Uh, understanding distortion patterns, and we, we were able to use Dan's awesome GeoCart software to make a lot of our distortion visualizations. So should you ever want to d visualize distortion, I highly recommend that as an option. Um, think about who the audience is for their, your map. Please don't accept the default values because they're probably bad. And never, ever forget about the impact of the periphery because it turns out that your map readers won't understand the impact of the periphery. So if you aren't thinking about it as well, you're just magnifying the badness. And that is, that is what we have to say. Thank you.